Um, I'm Ann Rieselbach, the League's Program Director. I'd like to welcome you to the second set of lectures by the 2016 winners of the annual Architectural League Prize for Young Architects and Designers. Once again, tonight's lecture is being live streamed, so this welcome extends both to the audience here as well as to those viewing the lectures online. Also, they'll be archived immediately, so if you know anyone who couldn't make it tonight, you can find them through the Parsons website, um, and then they'll be up on our website soon. Before we begin, some thanks are in order to the Parsons School of Design at the New School for once again co-sponsoring the lectures and ex exhibition, the combined expertise of Daniel Chu, Daisy Wong, Christina Kaufman, and Radhika Subramanian of the Sheila C. Johnson Design Center, it, who have, their combined efforts have really enriched the program in countless ways, from their advice and enthusiasm to their technical know-how for the um, exhibit installation. They help us um, and help the participants um, find ways to install their work that we never could have imagined at the League. And I think this year in particular, it's just created an, an incredible combination of work and room as a whole. The League would also like to thank the School of Constructed Environments for their help with exhibition logistics. The full League Prize program, on-site and online, including additional digital features to be released later this year, is made possible by support from Elise Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown and Tischler and Son, both longtime supporters of this program <coughs> and the League as a whole, and as well as new sponsor USAID Lighting. The program is also supported by the League's Next Generation Fund, a group of alumni of the League Prize, as well as the League's Emerging Voices Award. This competition, the competition for this program is open to architects and designers 10 years or less out of undergraduate or graduate school, recognizing young not as an age, but rather as a point in the span of their career. Although it is an open portfolio competition, there's a strong editorial component. Entrants are required to respond to a competition theme in the process of compiling their portfolio, necessitating that they identify the underlying and unifying meaning of their work. The theme is developed each year by the League Prize Committee, who also selects, by the way, they jury the projects for the competition, and they select, um, this, we, we, I think we use the phrase, more established members of the design community to serve alongside them on the jury. And the additional jurors this year were Mimi Huang, Paul Lewis, and Anu Matur. Um, they, so they choose the theme. It's always, it switches every year. It's relevant to architecture and design, and also to younger practices, which is why they choose it. And, we don't. Um, and on behalf of the League, I'd like to thank the committee members, Jason Austin, Rache Espinoza, and Gerald Bodziak, who will give you more background for their ideas and introduce tonight's speakers. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Anne. Um, before I begin, I would just like to thank Anne Rieselbach, uh, Rosalie, Ginevro and the Architectural League for their continued support of young architects and for providing a forum for designers at all point in their career. Um, the members of the Young Architects and Designers Committee, uh, comprised of me, Jason Austin, and Richie Espinoza, which I think Anne just said, uh, chose the theme impermanence in order to address the question of time in the production of contemporary architectural work, notably that of the young designer intended to provoke applicants to consider the form and meaning of ephemerality or permanence. The theme also tackled current aspects of society, economy, and policy. The Young Architects Committee and jury reviewed 97 portfolios that range from exceptional to the wonderfully strange and also to the utterly confounding, wherein each applicant demonstrated how the dimension of time is addressed in their body of work. Uh, we arrived at six finalists for this year's League Prize, three of which we'll be presenting this evening, G3 Architectos, Neme Studio, and Ultra Modern. While the six firms' work diverge in focus and approach, all posit a distinct personal outlook on the question of, ar of architectural permanence in a time of shifting ecologies, turbulent economies, communities in need, and expanding technologies. Uh, so the first practice presenting tonight is G3 Architectos, founded in 1997 in Queretaro, Mexico. The practice is led by Juan Alfonso Garduño Herdan, who earned a Master in Architecture and Urban Design at Harvard GSD, and a Bachelor of Architecture from ITESM Queretaro. Uh, he has taught architecture since 1998 at ITESM, where he was the program's director from 2007 to 2011. Uh, G3's submission began by presenting a point of view influenced by place and time. It reads, the traditional understanding of stability and permanence in architecture is challenged in developing countries with a shortage of built structures and a lack of resources. 
The work of our office begins with the available resources, material, labor, and time, to enhance a meaningful relationship with context and to dignify the habitable experience. Please join me in welcoming Alfonso Garduño. Uh, good night. Thank you very much for coming. It's such an honor to be with important person such as Todd. Thank you very much for coming. Um, well, uh, I had a tequila to see if I could be a little bit nervous, and if not, I will uh, apologize in advance for my English. So, um, I want to thank especially the League. I think you're not aware how much important this cultural uh, promotion is for countries such as ours, so uh, for young firms such as ours. So thank you very much to all the team. Thank you very much, uh, sincerely, uh, Anne, Math, Marta, Rosalind. Um, I like to thank, obviously, all the people who have uh, put on hours work and sweat to all these projects uh, in a long story of our office, as you already heard. Um, and especially starting with my partners, uh, Maria de los Angeles and Armando Gonzalez from the very beginning. I uh, like to thank to all the people in the office that has been there for many years. I'd like to thank uh, very much uh, Beto Meucci, a young associate that has just arrived, which has really uh, helped the office to boost up. Um, I really like to thank my wife for accompanying me and supporting all the time. Thank you very much, Anna. And she's co-designer of one of the, of the homes you're going to see tonight. So, uh, I like to thank. Uh, to finalize, just like to thank my, my family, my parents, especially because they are, uh, represent a lot of uh, influence and inspiration for myself. So, um, we've been taught uh, typically in the school in how to understand the space and how to resolve problems with space in a traditional matter, a way of, of, of teaching architecture. However, obviously, we, we, we tend to understand also the, the user, uh, but in our practice, we're really interested in, 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 in having a large context of understanding of each problem. So this uh, dichotomy, we like to have it more in, into a soul space, and rather than designing spaces, we like to think in experiences. So uh, a very recent family trip into La Tourette, which is a obviously inspiring space with light proportions, uh, has a lot to do, but half of it is also about being there with the family, with your kids, uh, seeing them run, seeing them uh, quiet and, 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 and coloring a book, or just relating it to the landscape, into the light. So once again, this dichotomy, if we want to layer up, just to explain a little bit more how we work, we would start by uh, showing that this space, um, we, we've been taught to understand form, we've been taught to understand construction, materials, proportions, but on the other hand, even if we have some education for that, we already, we, we really are interested in the other context, the, the ecological context, the economic context, the political context, the social context, which in somehow, in many cases are way more important than the spatial component of our works. And in sometimes they lead us into any strategy to step back in the typical um, anxiety of an architect to build. So uh, these all layers are addressed in every project because we have to think through those. Uh, however, they pass through a conceptualization filter that allowed us to um, Reevaluate and emphasize which topics or which layer would be the most important ones in each of the projects we're going to be dealing with. So uh, this graph, you will see it just in a few projects. We, we, we can just uh, either academic or professional. Uh, they represent some of the interest we look at and how these variables change a lot. Also, the methodology to address those. <coughs> so just very quickly, some of the projects we have done in many years. So the. Um, Impermanence. Uh, as you already heard, we, we tend to have this uh, lack of structures and resources to resolve our, our, our uh, spatial concerns. However, you can see in this image, even if this light tent was placed for this Sunday game, where there's n such a hostile space with rocks and dust, there's still an aim to colonize this space and to be there for a project there. The question raises, will this structure last longer than the aim to watch these games, and this is where we ask ourselves about permanence. And permanence, again, it is not about the solid 
the, the physical shape is more about the experience. So I cannot read here, but I will turn back. So I promise to be brief now since time is elastic. I am afraid you will have to listen to me for the next very long 800 uh, minutes. That's what uh, Octavio Paz said when he received his Nobel Prize. Therefore, the understanding of time has to do not only with the space, but actually the, 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 the way we understand we can actually see so many dramatic events that are last longer than the space where they happened. So uh, again, the most important thing for us is not the space, but not necessarily even though we are really uh, in love with space. So. Uh, this is a graph of the projects we're going to present tonight. They go from the larger scale to a very intimate scale, and they do have uh, different proportions of permanence you can see in the, in the graph below. However, our aim would be even if the physical form would not last so long, we would like as the experiential permanence to be way more lasting. So, Taller Activo. In a context where the only people who benefit from this model of development are the ones who build those houses, or actually the politicians who change the land use to make this happen, in a context where politicians tend to do projects for a short period of time regarding boats and doing projects for automobiles, even if only 40% of our population has a car, in a context if, uh, where there's a shortage of housing and people who ha cannot access the system has to live in, has to settle in informal spaces such as this one, in a context where architects are not the only ones who can build, actually anyone can build, an accountant, a lawyer, a student, for the good and for the bad. In a context where uh, digital technologies have colonized maybe a little too much the formal education in Mexico, but more specifically in a context where we can see these divided worlds in which one people from the si uh, in one side of, of, of this community not only has to look uh, to understand that he doesn't have enough of the opportunities, but he has in front of his face what he probably would like to have. So uh, these communities are left over without any support for either from the government or the market. Uh, this neo 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 um, uh, um, uh, sorry. So if they don't find opportunities by the formality, they have to find them in the informality. Therefore, we have the raised of the drug cartels, kidnapping, robberies. And this is the way they just can have to find their way out in, into this neoliberal model of development. So we, we want to ask ourselves, what do architects should do to help or to, to contribute with these developing uh, cities? Or in a specific research we have is could an alternative model based on the collective realm substitute our present neoliberal model? So some learnings from the first three years of this experiment. Uh, public space is really valuable, but if people is not involved, the, 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 uh, the public space will get empty. Uh, if you understand the dynamics of a community and actually empower them, in one year, the most modest project can actually be doubled by the community itself. If you find people that like and contrib contribute, but there are not enough, you don't have critical masses, you also will find some failures. The project is not about the finalized space. The most important part of the project is the process in which you actually are arranging, fixing the division and friction that are inside of the community, as you can see in this project. And also, we know and we understood in these three years that the physical or the uh, physical intervention is just half, even less than that for the development of a community. There's sometimes more important to have an economic development project um, cultural project rather than just have a physical space. So um, we have learned a lot with these th first three years. We learned, for example, that people will participate if they see a direct reaction in what their action did. If they don't see any results, they will, they will stop participating. So projects have to go really fast and they have to generate results very quickly. And also, if you understand or you are able to seek and to find communities that really participate and you empower them, they will really grow the participation, not only inside of the community, but in the community surrounded. So this is what we sent to the Bionial, which is a project of uh, research, Altos de San Pablo, Territories of Community Empowerment, uh, constructing a social, uh, social participation for a new territorial development. These are the two sheets we sent that I will explain a little bit more in detail, not much. So, 
Um, marginalization is really linked to collaborative work because they have to group themselves to, to, to be possible to get their properties. So, and also is what the city really needed. So we mapped in the city of Querétaro the most marginalized areas in the first circle. In the second one, there's analysis and a map and the rate of participation in that delegation. In the, in the third circle, you, it's a place we found, which is a community or a group named La Esperanza. And the third one is a map developed by mapping where the people in the La Esperanza group lived. So that was uh, the place where we were going to intervene. The methodology. In the first image, you will see where we find the most participation in a territory, and then we empower it. Participation grows not only in the community, but actually around the community. And then what happens is that you empower the communities that have risen up. And what you are aiming to have, or we are willing to have, is a social tissue that is now overlapped for purposes that could be done not by one community, but actually for several communities. So this is the map of Alto San Pablo, the project that we already have done. The, the number one is the base community, how we actually started this project. And then there's this, the second uh, and third intervention and the fourth intervention. So just to picturize them, the, 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 this is uh, the base community, the second project that wasn't uh, very successful, the third one that is quite successful. And what we're trying to do now is that um, using those community to uh, build larger infrastructure, let's say a street. Let's just have a little uh, look into the La Esperanza community. This is where they gather. They gather uh, at least 200 people every week for uh, collective purposes, which I think is beautiful. And we build with students some uh, compressed earth blocks uh, with, uh, with students, and many students actually credit for the design. It has to do with students, uh, Octavio, um, Fernando, and Luis. And then uh, we, we build with whatever resources we have. In this case, it's wasted sidewalks, wasted concrete cylinder bars, uh, and, and all, all the resources that people gave us. So this is the final project. I will pass quite quick. And the one thing important is that finally, we arrived with this community to do some productive projects. So we have three productive projects. One hasn't really, really uh, arised, which is the jelly factory. Then we have a kitchen that is working, and we have a recycle center. Before we finish, the community already took the space. Weeks later, they were still there. But it's amazing, because once you go back, then uh, okay, here it is. You, you will find this, and this is not an activity. This is as a series of activities, a summer camp for the children who ha can access to pay a summer camp. So the, the older kids show to the younger kids how to dance, and this is a project that lasts three weeks, and a huge coordination is required. So these communities are really developing the capacity to generate their own opportunities. A second very short video is here. They have they were able to bring someone to get their own um, professional gym with equipment and, and professionals. And so the community has access to things that they wouldn't just because we made a tent and they did the circus. And, and, and it's just amazing how much they can actually uh, get by their own. So a reflection of how to build city is we can have uh, one uh, 350 million bridge for people who have a car or 875 projects for people who has no opportunities. Um, the next project is a project for the children. This is Kinder Alamos. Um, it's in the five years of our lifetime where we actually develop ourselves the most, emotionally, psychologically, physically. It's a very important these five years to how we're gonna be developing in the rest of our lives. When we see this image and we answer what this is, we typically would say it's a box. And the same thing happened when we asked the teachers of this kindergarten if they could draw a house. This is what they draw. So this happens because we have been taught in the very same way for centuries, or at least for the last century. This is an image of 1910. And this is a recent image. So the information and knowledge comes from top down. The teacher tells the students what they should know and when they should know it. Therefore, Antoinette Portis puts in crisis this thesis and says, this is not a box. So what are you doing inside of that box? This is not a box. But why are you dressing with a box? And this is not a box. So 
the understanding of the world is something that could not be stopped and defined by one person. It's something that should be encouraged to be discovered and learned. The context of this project is this typical context of Querétaro. This is the, 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 the typical, typical landscape in water time. And this is the site we were working on. This is the, real, uh, the, the general campus, and this is the site for the kindergarten. So we had a few requests from the, from the uh, school. The first one, they wanted to have a wall, a really large wall. No student could be seen, no student could see out. The program, this is a series of classrooms, they own have their own uh, constructive stations to work, and they have a, their own patio, and, and they pass through this process, and they uh, later come out to the, to the uh, larger uh, central yard. So in the second stage, you have the administration and the direction that has to have this control. It's another requirement. They have to control every space of the kindergarten. It's obviously for, for uh, also one other constraint was that they have to, we have to use materials that were harmless for the kids. So now we are going around this kindergarten and you can see the wall built with the stone from the site. And then you can see the enter. And then you can advise that we are using exceptionally a lot of very um, undefined forms. And these forms will be uh, translated inside. Um, and after the kids go to their courses and they come out to the courtyard, this is what they will find. And, and, and this, again, is a more abstract field that is left for them to imagine and to define what it is. It could be a cloud, it could be a lizard, it could be a, a more um, a personal interpretation of this specific spot. Everything is done with. Uh, turf so that they won't hurt, be hurt. And again, going to uh, the adults' world that they have access to, the real world, and whatever that means. So um, again, just to end up this project, uh, is uh, very much in this relation, this wide volume showing into the contracts of the tough Querétaro uh, landscape. Two houses, two homes. Um, it is a quite interesting uh, theme for us. We have designed houses for many years, but we never arrived to do a house that we believe we really feel like that should be a house. So we have these two opportunities that we really, really are, are glad to. Uh, we, we really think in, let's say, the houses of the three, uh, the house of the three courtyards for me as Van der Rohe, in where the house is totally uh, introverted in, in for the inhabitant to live there um, out of the public realm to see and, and contemplate the garden and to build himself, to question himself and to build himself, which is uh, actually one of the things we, we really like as, as this first space, as Joanny Palasma says, this is the first place in how we relate to the world, especially Taiwan. So this is the space where we think is the most important space for the human beings to be, and we think it should be introverted. So um, this is more or less the the site. So that, that's the plot. Clients uh, like this place to be related to, to the uh, creek and to the natural landscape. And, and then here's the plot with three meter difference in level. This is the entry, so it's very narrow and it widens up. So to have access, to, to be able to have access in views, uh, and well, this is the restrictions for, for building. Uh, and there, the, the uh, car access is in one side, and the pedestrian side is, is in the other one. So the idea is that even from the bottom of the plot, always you could have an access view to, to the landscape. And, 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 and we have escalonated uh, some public uh, programs. There's a terrace, and there's a little patio, but are all, all connected. So. Um, the bedrooms have to be lift up, not to uh, stop the view. And now this is the house. So it's a quite, if not aggressive, it's quite tough uh, facade. You go around and still the scale is quite hard. And once you go closer, the scale comes a little bit uh, smaller. And then you change dramatically the scale, the texture, the light, and the view. You open the view, and then you're in relation with the, with the landscape. Um, for this matter, 
uh, we built all the bricks. Uh, Octavio here is the builder. He did a great job. But we, we built all the, the bricks uh, by hand with a machine of 300 pesos or $300. And, and, and we used these materials because we learned it from the communities. And we really think it's a beautiful material. And, and then it, it, material was very good to uh, frame and uh, to emphasize the light. So um, I, I have more material. But, well, so all, all the time you are connecting the views with the landscapes. This is the terrace. This is a view of the terrace. And then this is an important point for us. So this is stairs. And the stairs, it's a, it's, it's a point where you change from the public realm to the private realm. It's a transition that we, is quite important to us. But even more importantly, how the place is lived with the kids, with the children, with, uh, with their friends and how they improvise and they create different scenarios for the house. So the second house, uh, it's, it happened because they liked this house, which is something we were amazed of. So they asked us to do a house like that. And we were really thankful still. And, 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 but the thing is that they had a different context. They were in the middle of the neighborhood. So it was very hard to, to, to have the same thing. So we have to make an introverted house. So this is restrictions of the plot. Then we wanted to create a kind of a little forest to have this relation to the outside, but be intimated about it. So this is more or less an axonometric view of the house. This is the public area and how those views had to relate to, into the garden. In the higher part, we had the same, but now the neighbors could view, could, could see the house. So we built a large beam to protect the views. So. This is the first sketch of the house. And the idea was to have this monolith of, of very, very uh, tough facade with some penetrations of greenery. And when you enter it, the, change would change, the place would change. It would be open. It would be uh, just part of, a, of, of, a, of an open garden. So this is the house one built. Some images of the exterior. The interior. The back part, uh, but the seal, the, the garden is not grown. Well, you can see the intentions. Again, the stair is a very important part of the house uh, with a very emphasis, important emphasis of the light. And the upper part with the great beam, as I mentioned. So you can block the views from the exterior, but still keep your garden. And um, inhabiting the space. OK, Eleco. This is a project for the individual. The man of the 20th century feels overwhelmed by so much functionalism, so much logic, and so much useful, usefulness within modern architecture. This is a declaration of Matthias Geritz. Matthias Geritz opened in '53 this museum. This museum is a manifesto, well, a built manifesto of the emotional architecture, as he mentioned it. And, and, and it was not a frame for art. Mainly, it was a place that encouraged more interaction with arts, with other disciplines, such as dance, theater, or any other manifest. So the competition that we were invited, that we didn't have a chance to win, um, was about building inside of this patio. The only thing left over this patio, this is a large column. And even if uh, young friends who have win this and, and built this space and with fabulous, extraordinary uh, interventions, they, they have never looked at the column. So for the first time we saw, OK, let's think of the column. From 55 to 71, Matthias Gerex explored immensely the idea of the towers. Actually, they did the satellite towers that are very important. But there were other ones that were more interested to us. Um, these are the ones that we think really are uh, important, because they were inside of, the, of Matthias Gerex's studio. You, to enter, it was a small space. You had seven columns, seven meters tall. And you have to actually uh, pass through them to get into the working space. They were all in black, in white, white in white. And they had, any, they had no purpose at all, just to be there. All right. So uh, again, going back to our courtyard, we explore different positions. And the one thing we wanted to have was the columns to allow for activities to happen, but to give a them presence to interact with the people in the activities. Therefore, you can see very lightly uh, that this is a, a theater representation. So the columns become art actors in the scene. 
or you have an audiovisual presentation, so the columns shape the way this has to be addressed, or you have um, scenography presentations and the columns are the legs of the theater. Um, so the one thing we were interested in is in really emphasizing the spatial condition rather than the functional activities that were going to be there. And now how to build it? We understood that we, have a lot, uh, we could maybe make five columns. That's what we thought. But we were not going to do something that we could not achieve, so we did a prototype. This is a prototype we did. And, and it's, um, the, the great conflict about this column is that it's 12 meters tall, 60 centimeters wide, one meter long. And it could not have any footings. It's a three-month installation, so it has to be self-carrying. And it, ha it could not be, the, 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 the ground could not be perforated just as here. So uh, we did a dice, a concrete dice. And we did some um, foam uh, elements that were in compression. And it fell, it fell down many times. But we ended up having this structure um, achieving um, the resistance for the wind of 35 kilometers per hour. So that, that was quite enough, according to the analysis we did to the site. Uh, how we are in time? OK. So this is a very short video uh, that, that was important to us to build it. So this is a, a, a very short part of the video that happened to be very beautiful, because even Matthias Geritz mentioned that this was a spoil of his work, making towers. Architects really like to make towers. But this is so spoiled. So in this way, I think this is our spoil. We are trying to connect the earth with the sky. The project is this. Uh, we have the columns. We have some elevations. We have the internal view, which is quite important for, for the organizers. And then we have the models we did. We cast this in, in bronze, as Matthias get it. And we did a few models. Finally, we decided that the columns had to be covered with plaster. And it was very important, because people who went there long ago would know that the column was there. But probably, if they were not familiar with it, they would forget which column that was. So they would need to be in the research of the space, because this is, this is not the right space. Something happened. So we were counting in the air to blend the um, outside columns and to throw plaster into the soil and, and, and to show up which the original column was. So this process of understanding the space, revisiting the space, and to redefine the, the, the understanding of that space is quite important. And I think this is a, a beautiful site by Octavio Paz. Every time that the memory tries to recall, recall something, it reinvents it. The replica is never accurate. By fortune, memory is creative. So this is the last image of this project that could maybe witness how those alien columns pass through the patio. Last project. Um, this is a project for ourselves. This is a project inside out. It's a project that is exposed in here. It's such a blessing that we can sometimes have the time to do some work that we are really interested on. Someday a very wise man said that installations is the best way architects can have a space to exercise and to look for our own ideas. So this is one. Um, and the, the idea is that in this project, again, for us, it's, it's, it's a lot of layers that have to be done, not to mention that this project was built uh, in an airplane in four bags. So it was a matter of how, how to deal with the weight and how to deal with the space to bring them here. Uh, um, you will see the, and then uh, it's, it's a question in how do we uh, understand an exhibit and how this immediateness uh, of the image sometimes does not allow us to get, get us involved. So even if the piece we wanted to do was not a 2D, it was a 3D for, to, to experiment the space and we didn't have enough space to really be inside of the space, we, had, we, 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 could, make, we could force the viewer to interact with the piece and, and physically do some effort to actually try to see it all, right? So uh, also we share a little bit part of the process of building this. We did all the models and, and, and most of the, of the piece. Uh, we did not, did not the casting. Uh, but this is a foam, well, a foam uh, MDF model and a wax model. 
and the way the model had to cut and how some views were studied. This is the final piece. At the end, we understood, one, that the piece was small, so it was going to be eaten by the rest of the, of the exhibits. No, uh, but, but it, it needed a little bit more space. So uh, once we saw the, the, the piece that is casted inside of the concrete, we decided to, to cast a second one uh, and, and to exhibit. So you can see that piece shown, and it's the same piece that is uh, casted or inside the concrete. So this is Marta helping us <laughs> represent the idea. And thank you very much. Okay, our second firm presenting tonight is Neme Studio, which is based in Emeryville, California, and was founded by Mete San Sanmez and Neyran Turan in 2009. Neyran is an assistant professor of architecture at the University of California, Berkeley. She received a Doctor of Design from Harvard GSD, a Master of Environmental Design from Yale University School of Architecture, and a Bachelor of Architecture from Istanbul Technical University. Mete holds a Master of Architecture from Harvard GSD and a Bachelor of Architecture from Istanbul Technical University. In addition to his work at Neme Studio, he is also Director of Design at Page in San Francisco. In their submission, they focused on how architecture could be understood. They write, architecture is both a background and a measure against which the world might be read, and that their work aims at slightly unfamiliar interpretations of temporality flexibility, and legibility. Please join me in welcoming Neyran and Mete. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for being with us tonight. Um, first, we would like to thank Architectural League, and especially to Anne, Matt, and Marta for their amazing work for orchestrating all this. Um, thank you also to our fantastic team at Neme Studio, to Suhan, Keenan Gravier, Alex Patsier, and Darcy Spence for all their work for this installation, and to everyone who collaborated with us for various kinds of projects within the last couple of years. We are an architectural office that produces work ranging from buildings and installations to speculative projects in various scales. Our speculations in the office draw on the cultural and disciplinary potentials that are made possible by somewhat archaic, yet still very powerful architectural problems, such as form, representation, and materiality, and the unconventional collision of these problems with broader concerns of the city, environment, and geography. More recently, our work revolves around the idea of what we call the slightly unfamiliar, by that, we mean the subtle aesthetic tension between reality and abstraction in order to achieve a much deeper and nuanced engagement with reality. Here, we're thinking, for instance, as seen on the left, of photographer Laurent Marsoliers slightly distorted realisms of everyday life in her digital collages, and as seen on the right, of Roxy Payne's reproduction of the banal in his scaled diorama of a fast food kitchen produced entirely from birch and maple wood. For us, what both of these works share is a small degree of abstraction that renders familiar objects a bit unfamiliar. The slight distortion or abstraction enables us to re-engage with reality even more. This idea of the slightly unfamiliar is tested in two ways in our work. On the one hand, we're invested in experimenting on the unfamiliar interpretations of what is considered to be familiar, ordinary, or banal architectural elements such as the typical plants, suburban track homes, shotgun houses, or big box, warehouses, big box warehouses, and other forms of commonplace or vernacular architecture production that are not simply foregrounded, but are understood with a renewed rigor. On the other hand, in an, expand, in an attempt to expand our disciplinary imaginary, we're interested in speculating on the use of familiar architectural strategies on what is considered to be unfamiliar within a disciplinary setting, such as the territorial geometries of agricultural and resource extraction fields, geographies of resource and matter, and geological layers of the earth, etc., and bringing them into architecture consciousness. 
Our Museum of Lost Volumes project, for instance, aims to tackle such questions. As a geo-architecture fiction and a satire commentary on resource extraction, it provides an alternative focus on the mining of rare earth minerals. Rare earth minerals are a group of 17 chemical elements which are the backbone substance used in clean energy technologies, such as wind turbines, electric car batteries, solar panels, and energy efficient light bulbs. In this context, the project questions the idea of resource scarcity in the abundance of green technologies. The project tells the story of an imaginary future where all the rare earth minerals are depleted in the world because of their excessive use of these green technologies. This marks the end of the zero carbon hedonistic era and no more mining of rare earth elements happens after this time. The project imagines a museum for preserving and commemorating resource extraction ruins for a time when mining is an obsolete practice and treated similarly to an ancient monument or an extinct species to be housed in a museum. This room of the museum that you're staying showcases inverted pieces of rare earth mines, for instance, that are placed in preserved glass boxes. Juxtaposing an inquiry on modern and resource with monumentality, the project renders the geographic scale as a tangible entity through the limits and potentials of design thinking. Here, for instance, you're seeing a section of the museum that is dedicated to the museum's The Grand Tour, an excursion of several one-to-one -one scale rare earth replicas. And finally, this section of the museum you're seeing was divided into three parts and is connected with a single bridge that looks over the three different minerals. While the mines were placed into the underground, exhibiting the extraction processes of how they were removed from the earth, the visitors walked through the bridge, observing them. In his seminal 1967 study, geographer Clarence Glacken writes that there have been three main geographic ideas in ancient, since the ancient Greece. A designed earth, environmental influence, and the idea of a human as a geographic agent. More recently, this question is challenged by the idea of the Anthropocene. Deriving from the Greek roots anthropo, meaning human, and sin, meaning new, Anthropocene is presented as a distinct geological era that is marked decisively by the human terraforming of the Earth's surface. The proposition is that the changes brought to the planet by humans have become so prominent that they should establish a new geological epoch. According to this formulation, humans are now described not only as geographic, but also as geological agents. To call human beings as geological agents, as historian Deepesh Chakrapari argues, quote, is to scale up our imagination of the human, unquote. In the context of the debates on climate change and the Anthropocene, the Museum of Lost Volumes project positions architecture, both as a background and then as a measure against which the world might be read. Like architecture then, the project represents the world back to itself. Engaging in conversations such as the climate change forces architecture to embrace the potentials of permanence and rethink the idea of flexibility. With this in mind, we would like to talk about two other projects that we're currently working on, which look at the idea of longevity or long span. We will expand on the idea a little bit before talking about these two projects. For this, consider two images. First, as seen on the left, is the plan drawing of Carlo Fontana's 1725 project for the erection of a church on the arena of the Colosseum Amphitheater in Rome, which turns the oval organization of the existing plan into a centralized building arranged around circular passages. Second, as seen on the right, is a recent photograph of a plastic glomerate, a neologism for a new kind of stone proposed by geologists and oceanographers. This rock is hardened by molten plastic and natural debris and presented as a marker of human impact on the Earth's geology. When positioned next to one another, these two images put forward an important coupling of two different dimensions of longevity for us. First image shows the expanded lifespan of a particular building after its original use and its inherent capacity for flexibility despite its programmatic obsolescence. Second image, on the other hand, illustrates the idea of material long span, but its latent yet elongated temporality. Given our contemporary, contemporary environmental, political, and economic crisis, architecture might seem to need the most impermanence almost at the risk of disappearing. However, instead of associating impermanence with temporality and permanence with solidity and inflexibility, 
we are interested in more expanded associations that come with these terms. Perhaps similar to a polyestrine coffee cup or a takeout box, whose usage time is perhaps the most ephemeral, sometimes perhaps less than an hour, but who will be on the surface of the earth after 500 years? We believe that our objects, geographies, and geologies might need to be reimagined within longer span of time and larger span of earth. In that context, we're interested in the relevance of these questions for architecture. First project, titled Nine Islands, engages with the question of long span from a material point of view. The project is an installation that we're developing for the Istanbul Design Biennial this fall. It examines the under-conceptualized un, under relationship between architecture materiality and resource geographies. An article we encountered during our research created an important background for the project. In a 1972 architectural design article on then recently built 50-story One Shell Plaza in Houston, a description was provided for the lavish materials coming from every part of the planet for the building, ranging from primavera mahogany wood from Guatemala, Italian traversing quarried near Rome, and Persian walnut wood from Iran. Among these, the article's description of one particular material drew our attention the most. For the 26, ele 26 elevator caps of the building that each had nine feet walls covered with real leather, the article wrote that, quote, the architects wanted no seams or joints horizontally, so they had to search the world for nine foot cows, unquote, the biggest at the time. This led us to question how we understand materials of architecture in relation to their resources today. From the extraction of raw matter from a specific geographic location to their processing, transportation, and construction into a desired finished effect on the building, and finally, to its demolition, waste, and decomposition, the Nine Islands Project explores the spatial and temporal span of architecture materiality. The installation consists of an archipelago of nine islands, presented through five feet tall models on pedestals, each complemented by one drawing. Each island represents a particular lavish building material, such as leather, marble, wood, glass, travertine, gold, limestone, steel, or granite. The upper part of each island consists of an archetypical building form, each of which achieved through the elementary extrusion of primitive shapes, coated with the associated material. As an opposition to the upper part, the lower part of each island contains a formal land mass, or the source from which the raw matter is extracted quarry for the marble, tree for the wood, cows for the leather, etc. This stark contrast between the finished surfaces of the archetypical forms at the top with the vulgar formlessness of the naked resource origins below aims to call attention to the long span in between. Second project, titled Six Objects, 36 Plans, engages with the question of long span, this time with a particular focus on flexibility. The, process, the project consists of six medium-scale building proposals, uh, which investigate flexibility through the variation of certain plan typologies, such as the enfilade plan, the open plan, the hypostyle plan, to inhabited wall plan. Why each building is composed of deviations from a specific plan typology with six plan iterations, because of their various proportions of parameters, such as service versus open space area or structure versus aperture, each building offers a particular spectrum of flexibility, despite perceived as a permanent structure. Here, with object one, for instance, a flat plan on the ground level turns into an open plan on the top. Here, with object two, the building starts with open plan and transitions into hypostyle columns with poche space becoming infrastructure. And here, with object three, this elongated shear walls on the top levels transition into habitable wider spaces on the ground level. Here we see the second floor plan of the object three in further detail. The poche space get wide enough to accommodate micro units and necessary building infrastructures in the case of a shared living program. On the fifth floor of the same building, we're showing here a co-work space. And here's the section of the building with spaces ranging in size providing a spectrum of flexibility. While the most familiar architecture notion of the typical plan is studied, in this, is studied in this project, at the same time, we question and research inherent flexibility in various plan typologies. Okay. Well, um, as Nera mentioned at Nemes Studio, we are interested in 
the idea of slightly unfamiliar. We've been experimenting on this very idea through some of our recent commissioned and client-based projects as well, often by foregrounding certain familiar architecture elements. I will talk briefly about a couple of those projects. For instance, in our all glass uh, porcupine pavilion project in Houston, we emphasize the structure glass facade via serration. Essentially using this technique not only helped us to increase the structure efficiency of the glass enclosure to withstand lateral forces of the potential storms, but also provided varying degrees of transparency as the reflection transformed the angled glass. On our HRBG project, on the other hand, that we are currently working on, we were asked to renovate a warehouse design and a new co-work office building right adjacent to it. Here we investigated a new shed roof typology with differing profiles which became at the end a new unifying element that spanned over two buildings, old and new. And we also utilized a very familiar facade material, brick, especially in the context of Houston, but made it entirely from, a leftover, from leftover brick in various colors, various different colors and textures from our contractors' previous constructions, enabling a distinct graphic uh, reading at a very low cost budget. Now I'm going to talk about two houses a bit in a bit more detail uh, that both represents our sensibilities on this topic. Um, on our LV house project, which was commissioned as part of, a, a part of an affordable housing initiative in Houston, we particularly looked at the gable roof element and revisited the shotgun house typology. Um, providing maximum airflow within its elongated interior space with passive um, cooling properties, Shotgun House has been the most prominent low-income housing typology in the southern United States during the um, 19th and early 20th centuries. Here, we started with this um, iconic simplicity of the shotgun type and experimented on its potential by multiplying and doubling the profile. The project challenges, essentially challenges the traditional shotgun formed by introducing a planar twist in the middle of the project site. Basically, by pushing the back of the house off center, this twist allows for a larger outdoor space in the back within the constricted lot, and also creates a new spatial division within the larger interior space. A typical gable roof profile is extruded longitudinally from front to back and is sheared laterally in the middle. This shearing essentially introduce a new fascia on the sides and create a doubling effect from the street elevation. Here we start to see this new legibility on the street elevation. And here we see the plants just as similar to a typical shotgun house. We try to minimize and actually avoid to use um, hallways as much as possible. Um, this is another house we were fortunate enough that the same developer wanted to work with us again. And um, this house uh, was, uh, is located in um, uh, East Austin, Texas, and it is designed as a three-bedroom single-family house as part of an artist uh, housing community. Um, well, here we were intrigued by this interesting phenomena happening in Houston uh, currently. Um, the towers in downtown Houston mostly were built in the 70s and 80s uh, with lavish materials and spaces at the height of Houston's energy boom. Uh, most of these towers, just like Mont Shell Plaza that Nera mentioned earlier, are going through reno extensive renovations to reposition themselves uh, to attract more tenants and increase their occupancy. Well, for this, they try to reinvent their interior space, usually by discarding all these lavish materials that they have in, the, in their lobby, travertine or granite, whatever that might be. Once representing a sense of luxury and extravagance, these materials are now seen as the ultimate indication of an outdated looking lobby spaces for the owners and the real estate uh, agents alike. At this juncture, we wanted to repurpose these marbles on the AG house. Um, so essentially, this is, this is basically to highlight a delicate line in between what's considered outdated or familiar or the luxurious for us. The building, the building uses um, symmetry and primitive geometry in its design. The use of ang angled fascia enhances the frontality by enlarging the facade, which in return allows for more daylight penetration. By mirror mirroring the second floor over the first floor, the building introduces canopies and patios on both levels, 
as well as um, near interstitial spaces overlooking the double height section. In contrast to the spatial depth suggested by the front and back, suggested by the front and back that helps to transfer light and air, side elevations of the house have a more flattened and solid look. Um, well, shortly after we started working on the project, we were told by the developer that uh, this building can be uh, multiplied and uh, to actually be built some other locations as well, as they wish. So we took uh, this as an opportunity to create this drawing, not only to showcase the potential aggregations of AG house replications, but also the sheer amount of available materials, discarded available materials from Houston downtown. Um, for, the, for the last section of the lecture, we would like to end with two projects that further illustrate our interest in um, the relationship between geography and <coughs> architecture. This relationship has been a recurrent theme in our work, presented in various formats. Neyran, uh, particularly, um, um, has worked on this topic uh, quite extensively, and she is the founding editor-in-chief for New Geographies magazine, and she, um, uh, and she and I in the office, uh, we expand on this topic um, in order to bestow an alternative agency for architecture. Well, an earlier project from 2012 um, um, looks at this idea. Um, it's called Typo Project, and it introduces a new role for architecture at the territorial scale by proposing a group of collective institutions for the university campuses in Istanbul. Um, so here we propose a new framework in which the public and the private educational, um, educational entities collaborate on a new sharing model for university resources. So in contrast to a typical university model where a campus belongs to a university, in this model, uh, we propose a new uh, shared campus typology, each containing many universities in one location. To do this, we situate the project between two well-known urban design models, a master plan and a collection of point interventions. So this model, what we call master framework, accommodates certain features of both models, but proposes a hybrid approach with an open and flexible structure. So, for this um, project, two precedents were really influential for us. Um, first is the architect Matthias Ungers' uh, nuanced calibration of diversity and unity that existed in these projects from the 70s. And the second one was the abstract and elemental language of the territorial and iconic cutouts of Sol Levitz, a square of Chicago without a circle and triangle. So likewise, we speculate that the territories can have forms and that they can offer a very different level of legibility and monumentality. So positions positioned along the existing and future lines of major rail transit stops, the project proposes nine separate interventions located in the city center, at the urban edge, and in the ecological zones. Each campus intervention defines a legible territorial frame within its existing context. Through this context, we demark the newly appropriated campus buildings. This territorial frame acts as an open and porous edge for the redefined void inside and reimagines very small public parks um, and related programs. Um, these strategies are tested and applied in other locations as well. Um, and it is basically based on the given context. Um, here, for instance, we look at another campus situation by a major railway in more detail. And here are the old uh, large auditoria within that uh, structure. And here is a view towards the inner void. Well, in the end, um, the type of project can be taught as an experiment, really, um, on more nuanced relationship between monumentality and legibility at the um, territorial scale. Um, our recent straight installation exploits similar contrastations between the geographic and the architectural. By presenting a geographical feature as a withdrawn monolith, 
It aims to open up a range of aesthetic and political concerns for architectural imagination and the broader public. The installation was viewed at the Salt Gallery in Istanbul last summer. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of a background for the project. In March 1994, a dramatic accident occurred in the Basra Strait of Istanbul. A 100,000 ton tanker carrying crude oil from Russia collided with a cargo ship at the northern exit of the strait. The cargo ship exploded and ran aground, while the oil tanker immediately caught fire and released more than 13,000 13, tons of oil into the sea. The fire continued for weeks, causing a devastating environmental disaster. This accident marked a delicate moment in the history of the Basra Strait. After the collapse of the Soviet Union and the opening of the Caspian oil reserves in the 90s, the strait became one of the six busiest oil shipping choke points in the world. Compared to the other routes, trade routes, however, the Bosphorus is unique as one of the narrowest and the most urbanized, as it passes through the heart of Istanbul, a city of 14, 14 million citizens. To complicate matters even further, the geographic form of the strait, with its sharp and narrow turns, makes it one of the most risky and difficult channels to navigate in the world. Despite the seriousness of the environmental risk, contemporary environmental concerns regarding the transit of coal's colossal oil tankers through this navigational route have been conflicted with the controversies around transnational energy pipelines and various other large-scale infrastructural and urban transformation projects. The straight installation brings this framework to architectural and urban imaginaries by manifesting the narrow strait through the tangible experience of an installation object. Invading the entrance floor of the gallery as an out-of-scale monolith, the installation introduces the idea of the geographic object as an extrusion of the Bosphorus Strait shoreline to the height of the gallery ceiling without articulating its actual topography. While the uh, object is scaled, so the tightest point in the strait measured 90 centimeters, which is the minimum dimension for a door opening, the visitor's pathway through the installation evokes the narrowness of the Basra Strait through architectural language. In this way, the object renders the Bosphorus as a constricted experiential condition. To amplify the contestation between architectural and geographic scales, the installation reconstruct, reconstructs the crenellated shorelines of the Bosphorus with locally used crown molding section profiles, commonly used as interior ceiling ornamentation in Istanbul. By collapsing the vertical extrusion of geogra geographic information, in this case the shorelines, with the horizontal extrusion of a ceiling ornamental profile, the shorelines become both more tangible and more abstracted at an architectural scale. While utilizing the elemental technique of horizontal and vertical geomet geometric extrusions, the project sets out a new dialogue as though Super Studio's horizontal extrusion of the New York profile suddenly starts speaking with Ms. van der Rohe's vertical charcoal extrusions. These extrusions required many, many drawings, obviously, and um, uh, we, we drew them all. <laughs> There's nothing else to say, I guess. <laughs> as part of the exhibition, the installation object is also accompanied by the presentation of a, what we call a geographic fiction a story illustrated through a series of speculative architectural drawings and presented in the form of a silent film. The story depicts an intent in 2025 when Oilella, the fictional biggest oil tanker in the world, gets stuck in the Bosphorus. This incident not only blocks the passageway forever, but also causes the Bosphorus to be transformed into a new land of urban development. In the story, while some structures on the Bosphorus turn into touristic destinations depicting an archaeology of an, of an oil shipping landscape, new developments take advantage um, of this rapidly urbanizing land. For new construction, while building codes get created by taking Oilella as a guideline for the most historical structure, famous architects were commissioned for new buildings on this location. And 
Monuments get built com to commemorate previous oil spills on the spot where they were happen. The volume of each monument represents the actual amount of oil spilled during each specific accident. Finally, the installation object of the strait is presented in the film as one of those monuments built to remember the original shoreline that dissolved after the infill. Instead of conceptualizing the environment as purely natural and therefore needing to be preserved and protected, or as merely systemic and needing to be managed and maintained as a problem, straight project manifests the environment as aesthetic and monumental. By suggesting a non-naturalistic and more monumental conception of the environment, it projects an alternative relationship between geography and architecture, one that is slightly unfamiliar. Well, we are about to be done, um, but um, we wanted to um, close with this um, um, as an epilogue, I, I guess. Um, um, so this is our work um, for the Architecture League exhibition. And for our installation, we wanted to represent um, all our most recent project um, altogether over a continuous imaginary landscape. Um, for each project lands onto this territory, this imaginary territory, basically, um, we brought them with their own context in their real world. Um, here, for instance, you see the HRBG uh, building uh, with its streets, uh, the light rail right in front of it, and all the utility boxes even in front of the um, in front of the their in front of their entrance. And then the type of project on the upper left corner starts to appear unexpectedly. And basically, you can start to see all these sort of unexpected relationship in a way, in a, relationships in a way among all these projects throughout, the land, throughout this landscape. Well, in the end, just like a capriccio in painting, where architectural ruins are collected and compressed in an imaginary time and space, we invite the observer to experience and imagine our recent work all together in the landscape of one large drawing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our last uh, and third presentation this evening features the work of Ultra Modern, located in Providence, Rhode Island, and led by Yasmin Vobis and Aaron Forrest. Yasmin teaches architecture at the Rhode Island School of Design. She received her Bachelor of Arts from the University of California, Berkeley, and her Master of Architecture from Princeton University. She is also a recipient of the 2016 Rome Prize in Architecture. Erin is an assistant professor of architecture at the Rhode Island School of Design and has a Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Architecture from Princeton University. In their submission, they question the role of permanence in architecture, noting that when solidity is the focus, it privileges the thing over the actions it makes possible. Related to this, they see their task as creating conditions for new types of action, the result of which are spaces of improvisational nature that demand an active public and are open to reinterpretation and use. Please join me in welcoming Yasmin and Aaron. Hi, um, it's an incredible honor to be here. Um, I'd like to say thank you to the Architectural League. Um, as has been mentioned before, of course, Anne, Marta, and Matt were completely instrumental in making the exhibition outside possible. Um, I'd also like to thank our team at Ultra Modern in Providence, um, everyone that helped on the projects and um, the exhibition, of course, um, as well as our friends and mentors, some of who are in the audience. Um, it's great to see you, and thank you for all the support. OK, so we're going to start with a story. <coughs> um, so Yasmin and I met in fall 2006. Shortly thereafter, we began our first project. <coughs> At the time, live webcams were still in vogue, and Bryant Park had a pretty good one. If you spent enough time on the site, you could find a direct link to the latest image, which was updated every 10 minutes. So we began downloading the images and collecting them on a hard drive without much of a purpose in mind, except maybe to create a little time-lapse video. They became a nice chronicle of the use of one of the most photogenic public spaces in the country, the way people would move chairs around, congregate, sunbathe, etc. 
was fun. <clears throat> After a few days, we had compiled a few hundred images and started to get concerned about storage space. It wasn't the days of floppy disks, but still, we needed to do something with these or get them off the drive. So we started overlaying them and uh, to see what a whole day in Bryant Park would look like in a single image. What was amazing <clears throat> was that a completely different chronicle of the space began to emerge. Individual activities may have seemed important in single images got blurred over in favor of a haze of motion. Blurred clusters of activity now took precedence over singular acts. And the massive transformations of the site over the course of the year, from lawn to concert venue to fashion show to skating rink, became more apparent as fascinating as the human dramas that played out on the lawn over the summer. Days turned into weeks and activities became hazier still. Human motion settled into a gray blur over the site and event architectures began to emerge. Entire weeks worth of images were given over to construction and demolition of various tents and stages forming quasi-architectural lacuna in the life of this iconic public space. As a year of collecting images passed, we pulled the plug and made the final image in the series, a one-year average. Here, individual actions completely fall away, and the architecture, both permanent and temporary, emerges <clears throat> as the only marker of stability on a site completely in flux. This project, innocent as it was at the time, served to crystallize an approach that revels in the simultaneity of the architectural project as a conceptual, social, and material practice. Architecture only makes sense as a means of bringing disparate things together, drawing and building, sustainability and aesthetics, rule-based geometries and resistant materials, unconventional spaces, and even more unconventional inhabitants. As the Bryant Park averages began to make clear, these seemingly contradictory aspects of the project are able to coexist partially because they exist on disparate and overlapping timescales. Over the years working together, <coughs> so far we have worked to follow the idea to combine rather than to isolate in the hopes of finding new and unexpected forms for building and for living. <coughs> so this evening we will share three projects that have sought to merge the two different definitions of the word structure. That of literal structure, or how things stand up, exemplified by the Shukov radio tower seen on the left, and that of organization or social structure, exemplified by the Alda Van Eyck project on the right. Something that we've become more and more interested in recently is how these two definitions of structure can be put in dialogue with one another. The experiments in material structure might push us towards alternative spatial and the social organizations and vice versa. So um, the first project we're gonna share is called Four Corners and this was actually a project for the Boston Society of Architects. Um, they held a competition for an exhibition on um, mass timber in the city. And I'm sure all of you have heard the kind of sustainability arguments for mass timber, but I think for us, it's also interesting to think about the kind of potentials for architects to rethink um, architecture and structure in the, in, you know, with this new material. It's a bit like, you know, um, beginning of the 20th century when steel and concrete uh, came to the fore and there was all this, this sense of experimentation um, and you know the kind of new things that could be possible with the material. Um, but we also kind of looked backward a little bit. So we, we kind of looked at the history of um, heavy timber construction and, and timber construction in the Northeast um, and in particularly barns. Um, because barns, ha they, they have this kind of incredible fit between the structure of the space and the space itself. The kind of form of the barn is so well integrated with the actual structural system. It's a kind of architecture of structure and space, we would say. Um, and of course, barns are made up um, through these things called bent bents. So these are these kind of two-dimensional constructs that can be um, kind of arrayed in progression to create the space of the barn. But of course, um, thinking then, um, of, of the space of barns and uh, in relationship to CLT, this new engineered uh, mass timber technology, there's this friction, right? You can't just reproduce the kind of um, two-dimensional bents and have it kind of work. You have to kind of think about um, using this planar, planar material um, and uh, perhaps start to build these kind of complementary corners that could start to um, be more rigid and kind of come together in a new way. So starting out, um, I guess, with the kind of form of the barn, taking it apart and rearranging these complementary corners, you can imagine creating this kind of very 
you know, this endless field of these things where all the kind of um, three-dimensional bits are now interdependent. Um, and for the installation, I mean, you can see really that the, the barn, the kind of interior spatiality of the barn is turned inside out. Um, it creates this kind of series of rooms um, that open up uh, to its context. So, you know, corridors, uh, these kind of uh, pockets of space around the installation that open to the windows, as well as the little courtyard in the center. So um, this is the image of the final installation in place, and it um, looks really easy. It, it wasn't quite as easy as it was. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take you through a little bit of the, um, the design and construction process. So we were um, teamed up as part of the exhibition with, um, with a, a timber erector based in New Hampshire called Bensonwood and a, um, and a um, mass timber fabricator based in northern Quebec province, 10 hours north of Montreal, um, called Nordic Structures. And um, basically, um, the way the process worked was that uh, Nordic makes these 8 foot by 64 foot slabs of, of solid wood that you can see in their factory on the left. And then they cut them down to your specifications using their um, CNC uh, uh, cutting devices. You see on the right, and we had to work with um, both companies very carefully through a year-long design process in order to come up with a series of details that were um, kind of uh, clean and spare, but also were easy to assemble and could still be fabricated by the machines, which had their own limitations. <clears throat> and what was um, great about the process, even though it was um, a lot of work at the time, <laughs> was that. Uh, the results of it, if you plan it out carefully enough, were that you could take this rough structural material and create very large spans with it and have five different pieces come together with a tolerance of only a sixteenth of an inch. Um, and it, typically CLT is used in, uh, in kind of commodity circumstances. Um, and so most of what they usually do is get, cut rectangles out of rectangles. And so um, we had these efficiency targets to meet in order to get the project in on budget. So we had to kind of work through the space packing exercise as well to figure out how all these crazy pieces fit onto the 8 foot by 64 foot slabs of CLT. Um, and we worked with a small group of um, friends and uh, Parsons students, three of whom are shown here. Uh, to construct the project in the field. We're lifting this roof panel, which probably weighs about uh, 200 pounds. Um, despite the kind of bulk and heaviness of these panels, the project went together really easily. It went together in about uh, three days. Um, and what was really nice about the, the <laughs> final project was that it, it didn't result in a kind of single image, but that it was really ne necessary to kind of move around um, move around and through the installation in order to understand it um, and to see how it presented itself from all these different aspects. Um, and we also uh, worked with a video artist based here in New York, uh, Noah Klersfeld, who's in the audience tonight, um, to figure out how to program the little courtyard that Yasmin showed <coughs> in order to encourage people to actually move through and in this into the space. Um, so he, uh, he very generously donated three of his videos to play in the courtyard during the, um, during the entire exhibition. And we also um, had Nordic drill these uh, little peepholes in the wall of the corridor so that you could see that um, it, you'd be drawn into the corridor to see that video um, through those holes and then also allow it to bring uh, a kind of lighting effect into the courtyard. And that's the view out. So the second project is actually also a competition um, that was for the Chicago Architecture Biennial last year. Um, for us, the prompt was very intriguing because um, they were essentially asking designers to um, design small kiosks that would actually remain in the city after um, the biennial uh, would leave. And so this idea that it would leave something permanent, um, this kind of act of generosity to the city, was very in uh, just interesting to us. Um, now, of course, the site is this incredible place where the kind of relentless grid of the city meets the beach. Um, and starting the project, we couldn't help but think of these kind of two very Chicago um, progeny, really. Um, on the one hand, Mises uh, experiments in long span structures and this kind of flatness, um, such as at IIT Crown Hall. Um, and on the right, you know, the 
Ray and Charles Eames' film, Powers of Ten, which asks this incredible question of what happens when, to our understanding of things when you actually jump scales. So questions of scale were really important. Um, the competition actually stipulated a 200 square foot kiosk. Um, and we felt that in order to really have a kind of more active engagement with, with the city, we would try and expand that as much as possible. And so we, it kind of became this quest, I would say, um, to uh, design the kind of largest, uh, thinnest wood roof possible. Um, and then also, uh, you know, being right on the lake, there's, there was this incredible opportunity to engage the horizon. Um, and so the project tries to kind of use the kind of large flatness of the roof um, to both look at the, you know, the uh, horizon of Lake Michigan beyond, but also when you get up above the roof, that the roof becomes this kind of abstract plane that can reframe the city. Um, so the plan is incredibly simple. Um, just to give you guys a sense, uh, the, the space that's labeled vendor is the kind of square footage that was asked for in the competition. And then the dashed line is, is what we proposed. And so in order to do something like this, it, of course it had to be incredibly simple. Um, and so, so it was really also um, trying to understand the project of, of kind of dissolving the boundary of the kiosk into the city. So really encouraging um, kind of different um, <coughs> users to really come into the space and use them as they see fit. Um, so really there's these kind of three elements to the project, a very large wood roof, um, it's 56 by 56 feet, um, a set of 13 columns that support the roof. Um, that are arranged in this kind of radial pattern and then that kind of leisurely but engaged public that would come to occupy it. Um, so in order to make this shift in scale, we had to really pare down our material palette um, to, to the minimum possible. So we knew that we had to have um, the structure. So we, we worked with CLT again for this project. And then for the enclosures, we um, just uh, decided to, we didn't have much specification on what the enclosures needed to enclose, and so we thought, well, maybe chain link fence is enough. So we just worked with chain link uh, mesh fabric, but both materials in a kind of scale and context um, that's a little different from where you usually see them. Um, and uh, we were pretty quickly confronted with this question of, well, okay, what is the biggest um, wood roof that you can make? And we knew that, um, that we could get these eight foot by 64 foot panels of CLT. Um, but it turned out that the the real limitation was on uh, was not on production but on shipping, and that the largest size you could reasonably ship was on a 53 foot trailer, and um, we somehow managed to convince them to put a 56 foot uh, piece onto a 53 foot trailer, <laughs> and and uh, I don't know how that got across the border, but the <laughs> but um, it it worked, and that set the dimensions of the project. And then we worked with um, a, a colleague of ours at RISD, uh, Brett Schneider, who's also uh, an associate, uh, senior associate at uh, Guy Nordenson and Associates Structural Engineers, to really work through the, the, um, the design and the feasibility of the project in order to s figure out what was the minimum number of columns and what was the maximum span between them. Um, and the, um, you can see the way the, the columns are these kind of fin shapes that are arrayed around radially. That was partly to kind of force your attention outwards and partly to resist uh, what we learned were very strong winds coming off of uh, Lake Michigan. Um, and so the, the scheme um, is fairly simple in order to, uh, or seemed fairly simple at the start, which was in order to get this, um, this kind of flat, conc uh, flat uh, wood roof that behaved somewhat like a concrete roof. We would just take seven panels of CLT and run them north-south and then put another seven uh, panels right on top of that running east-west and support that on uh, 13 columns. What we didn't realize at the time, we were acting kind of naively, was that usually CLT um, is supported with beams and so this turned out to be a kind of first of its kind um, structure uh, thanks to Brett's perseverance on the project. Um, so one of the, the major crises in the project was actually um, figuring out how to get those two layers of CLT to work together um, uh, structurally, but also economically. So we worked through kind of frantically through the last summer uh, through many different uh, fastener schemes, including one that involved a lot of glue. Um, <laughs> and you can see the, the scheme on the left, which was one of the earlier schemes involved about 15,000 screws, which cost $2 each and wouldn't have worked. Um, and the scheme on the right fortunately got it down to about 3,000 uh, 
3,000 screws. Um, and then we were, uh, of course, as Yasmin mentioned, looking at Mies van der Rohe as a, as a kind of spiritual godfather of the project. Um, and uh, especially at the new National Gallery, which, which they raised up on, on the roof up on the columns at the end of the project. And we thought, well, wouldn't it be romantic if, if that was how it was built? And so we showed this image in uh, the competition. And then after working through it with the fabricator and the, the um, structural erector, it turned out that that actually was the best way for safety reasons, interestingly enough. So they ended up building it just a few feet off the ground on um, steel shoring and then uh, using pneumatic jacks to raise it up. That's view from the roof halfway through. Um, and then in order to keep the, that wood ceiling surface as clean as possible, um, we worked with Brett and with Nordic to develop um, this column capital detail that actually hangs the roof, uh, suspends it from above rather than supports it from below. And then um, I guess the second material that's quite visible in the project is also this kind of rough, uh, rough material of chain link. And um, we're quite interested in it because, I mean, on the one hand, you see chain link everywhere. It's usually, you know, stretched horizontally between very um, kind of heavy vertical posts, but also um, it has this interesting history in that it was invented by a textile manufacturer. And so we were really interested in trying to think, is there a way to treat it as a textile and, you know, with this kind of lightness um, to it. And so we worked on the, on the detailing to actually, you know, actually stretch it vertically between the roof plane and the ground, um, and also to um, eliminate all the framing at the corners of these volumes so that there would just be this kind of very light touch in the space to delineate those, those two volumes. Um, so the site uh, is, is actually just north of the Shedd Aquarium and the Field Museum in Chicago, and it's, it's right on the lake um, and has this incredible view back to the city. We were very lucky. Um, and the, one other aspect of the project, I guess, uh, you know, it being out in, in the world, um, we really wanted to kind of extend the life of the project through into the night. And so um, we developed a lighting installation that would um, kind of illuminate the two volumes below um, through two different uh, colors of color temperatures of LEDs. So one warm, one cool, one more like daylight, one more like moonlight, and then um, to, to program these in such a way that they would start to come on um, just a few hours before sunset and then kind of pulsate throughout the night. And so we saw some two views of those at night. Um, and I should mention these photos are by Naho Kubota, uh, who's an incredible photographer. Um, and uh, she took this one, which really kind of startled us because it looked so much like our initial model. Um, and we kind of really enjoyed that. <laughs> and this final project is our uh, proposal for the PS1 warm-up competition, which uh, we did this past, uh, this past winter. And we were really um, interested in the project um, in kind of ma making a hybrid between what have become the two standard typologies of the PS1 proposals. One is the kind of environment um, which takes place under a canopy, and the other is the kind of um, sculptural um, or iconic uh, large-scale um, project that's visible from the street. And we thought that the way to approach this was actually to um, think about it in different terms um, through that of the boundary, which we saw as this kind of fundamental architectural act that creates the kind of basic difference between two spaces inside and out, um, and thus kind of facilitates different types of culture with, between those different types of spaces. <coughs> and uh, we, we were you know, working at PS1, which is um, formerly a public school. Um, and so we started looking at uh, old schoolyards and um, how the schoolyard kind of functioned as, as this interesting place that was attached to the adjacent institution, but not really of it. It's this place that's usually lightly veiled by a, a chain link boundary that um, protects it both from the harsh realities of the city, um, but also from the school and the kind of stern teachers inside. Um, and so it's this, it's this place where students escape even just for a few minutes every day. Um, in order to uh, kind of play their games and actually f uh, get into mischief and formulate their own rules, which then kind of come back and infect their work in the, sco in the school and out in the city beyond. So the question really was, how do you kind of create this space apart in a, in a city as dense as New York? Um, and we, you know, looking at, at the space of the courtyard, we really wanted to inscribe, 
you know, inscribe something very simple. And so this geometry of an inscribed circle that relates to the context but is also sets itself ap apart from it um, seemed promising. And so the project is really about the creation of this clearing uh, in the courtyard, uh, a kind of space for recess, as Erin mentioned. Um, and you can see in the site plan, it's something that kind of fills the courtyard. Um, it's something that has to be kind of negotiated on your way to the museum, um, you know, uh, or, or to a music event or whatever you're there to do. Um, and it's also something that's very tall. Um, it's, we proposed a 50 foot tall uh, volume, 50 foot tall volume. Um, that would kind of very lightly screen the, the city beyond um, to create this kind of necessary precondition for fantasy and for play, this kind of removal. Um, and that boundary is really, uh, we propose to make it out of two layers of chain link. Uh, so one is kind of vertical outer layer and one that's more playful, one that's um, just left galvanized, another that's brightly colored. Um, to create this kind of boundary also that has a certain depth that could be uh, that's kind of ready for, for exploration. So our initial um, idea was to just make this 80 foot diameter, 50 foot tall cylinder out of chain link and call it a day. <laughs> and so we did a test in our studio. Um, and I don't know if you've ever worked with chain link that's not already stretched, but it, it's, um, it, it doesn't behave. And so we zip tied the whole thing together and we we're like, that's the trick, it's gonna be done. And then it, it, this picture was the moment of perfection that it fell over. So then we, we went and, and um, talked to Brett Schneider again and we said, okay, how, how can we really do this? And we worked through a, a, a long series of, of structural models in order to figure out how to, make, um, how to make this thing stand up, but also how to kind of preserve that idea of the, of the lightness of the boundary. Um, and what was a kind of interesting outcome of this result was that we ended up using the same materials as in um, Chicago, but in inverse proportion. Um, and in, in, in the case here, both the wood and the, um, and the chain link are performing structurally. So it, it took a while to figure out how to, uh, for Brett to figure out how to model it in a kind of satisfactory way so he would be convinced that it would be safe. Um, and it turned out that the, the kind of resulting concept was that kind of analogous to a bicycle wheel, except stretched um, horizontally out of plane. So the, um, there's a, a timber tension ring up at the top 50 feet in the air that's supported by a series of canted columns that are kind of analogous to those bicycle spokes that's then all pulled down and made stable by the chain link that's tensioned to the ground. Um, and of course, there's been uh, 19 years of PS1 uh, installations before us, so we don't really know what's under the ground. So we came up with this flexible system of columns that could be kind of moved back and forth on site depending on what we found. And that would also serve to give a kind of subtle hierarchy to the interior space. Yeah, so um, the hierarchy is important because it's, it's absolutely not just a neutral space. Um, I think that, there, that, that the way the columns kind of um, enter the space creates I think an order that uh, we imagined would be kind of used for different programming possibilities. So on the one hand, there's the warm-ups and this, there's the kind of free play during the day. But on the other hand, I, we imagined that players and um, performers could kind of take advantage of some of these geometries and use them for kind of rule-based movements. So you see some images here. Also, of course, um, we imagined that this would be scaled to the mass and would kind of be able to embrace that kind of large quantity of people that comes to PS1 during the warm-ups. Um. And the, the two layers of chain link um, serve you know, multiple purposes. One was to create these kind of back alleyways of a secondary system of circulation and storage um, for some of the materials in the project, but, um, but also to kind of uh, create this uh, kind of moiré effect between the two layers that would shift and change as you moved um, and thus kind of ne necessitate moving uh, around and through the project in order to fully understand it. So here in the section you can see how that uh, kind of inner layer moves in and out and even in the still image the way you get these kind of interference patterns between the two layers. Um, and this resulted in a kind of interesting um, design challenge because we had to figure out how to take something, uh, take something that was a perfect cylinder on the exterior and project all the openings and panelization inwards to this kind of um, strangely shaped object on the interior that, uh, uh, that created this kind of interesting dialogue between the 
kind of um, platonic exterior and something a little stranger inside. Uh, the double layer also helped um, to, to shade the courtyard, which I'm sure many of you know can be kind of brutal in the summer. Um, but also to cast shadows onto the ground to create a kind of third layer in, uh, in this moiré effect. Um, we also imagined that there be, would be a series of kind of um, elements for playing, so hula hoops, jump ropes, frisbees, these kind of very minimal tools for rule-based movement um, that could be stored between the layers of chain link. And of course, continuing our investigations with chain link, uh, we imagined there could be these kind of overscaled um, balls uh, that could confound the, both the scale of the players, but also the scale of the space, um, as well as these kind of uh, very large model scale, model, scale model trees. <laughs> Um, that were, you know, supposed to be made simply of uh, lumber and construction netting for diffusing light and, and water. Um, but really all these elements kind of conspire together to create this wireframe world. It's this kind of very, um, yeah, it, I guess a space apart where um, we imagined play would be possible. And um, we also worked with a lighting designer to think about um, the kind of reading of the volume at night from the street and to kind of find a way to, uh, to make that very, very large volume kind of hover in the space at night. Um. So again, in order to make something so large, we had to kind of economize and treat everything uh, structurally. And so th this was the basic kit of parts, um, a bunch of wood and chain link and some ground screws to, to support it. Um, we also had to think through how to um, how to lay it out, knowing that we probably wouldn't be able to hire a surveyor to do it. So we had to take that kind of interior um, uh, unusual geometry and think about how to rationalize it. Um, and then we worked with uh, with a contractor to think through how it would be built, and it turned out that the probably the easiest way to do it would have been to build the, um, the similar to Chicago, build the entire timber ring just a few feet off the ground, attach all the columns to it with hinge connections as well as all the bales of chain link, and then lift it all at once in a single move, um, turning the construction itself into a kind of event of the project. And we'll just finish by playing this animation. So this is the parking lot just south of the architecture building at uh, RISD uh, where we teach and we worked with a bunch of students to lay out the project at full scale. Um, there's a bar in the adjacent building and someone the night before had uh, wisely decided not to drive home and they left their car in the middle so sometimes if you squint carefully you can see the outlines of a Volvo in the middle. <laughs> It was, it was fun doing this partly because there turned out to be this kind of nice um, parallel between the act of architectural drawing and the kind of ideas of play that we were interested in. version of the